So this morning, we are going to be looking at, if you have your Bibles, please turn to Matthew 24, verses 1 to 25, the reading. The title of the message is, When Jesus Returns, Signs of the End Times. And you know, I always pray about what to preach on Sunday, and I really felt like God was telling me to do this sermon. Um, so we're going to learn today, Signs of the End Times. And so here's what uh, Matthew 24, 1 to 25. I'm going to read scripture, and then we're going to pray together. In your bulletins, there is a handout. If you want to follow along, you can do so. Great, and it's working today. Good. So here's what the word of God said. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. He said, do you see all these things? I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. And Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many. You will hear of wars, rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of birth pains. Then you'll be handed over to be persecuted, put to death, and you'll be hated by all nations because of me. Jesus is talking here. At that time, many will turn away from their faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he, or the person who stands firm to the end, will be saved. Amen? And the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. That's you and me. That then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of his house go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be for those, those pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. For there is going to be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. 25, see, I have told you ahead of time. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do pray that this uh, time of your reading, your word, will be a time of just understanding God's word, a time of understanding, um, you know, our time. And we just pray, God, that you will help us to know there's a time when you're going to return. And we pray that you will help us not to uh, feel fearful, but to understand that you, you spoke these things ahead of time so that we would be ready and that we would be warned. So we pray right now that your Holy Spirit will just touch us as we go through the sermon. In Jesus' name, amen. So in this passage, Jesus is having this conversation with his disciples. And um, it's during the week of the, the Holy Week, I believe. And so on the Sunday, he comes in on the donkey. They're praising the Lord. They're saying, you know, uh, Hosanna, um, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Then on the Monday, he goes to the temple and he's upset because in the temple, they're selling product and they shouldn't be selling things in God's house. Jesus said, my house is supposed to be a house of prayer, not a house of robbers. And then on Tuesday, he's debating with the religious leaders. And so all this is happening because Jesus knows his time is coming. He knows his time is coming to die. He knows he's going to rise again. He knows he has to ascend to heaven. And he knows that he needs to fulfill his purpose. And so he begins to talk to the disciples. And he says to them as they're walking, he says, Jesus says, they left the temp Jesus left the temple and was walking when his disciples came to him. And he says, you see all these buildings, and this is in Jerusalem. You see all these buildings, he says, I tell you the truth, not one of them will be left standing. Jesus was talking about the destruction that was going to take place in Jerusalem, the temple in 70 AD. AD means after death, which means after Jesus' time. 
And so this actually happened. So Jesus is prophesying that there's going to be a time in Jerusalem where the temple is going to be destroyed. And this statement would have been a shock to the disciples because the Jews had finished rebuilding it. You know, they had just finished rebuilding the temple because it was already destroyed. And so it would have been a shock for them to hear again that their beloved temple, their beloved synagogue was going to be destroyed. And then, he, then they say to, to Jesus, they said to Jesus, tell us, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So now Jesus begins to tackle this question of, what will be the signs when Jesus will return? And Jesus begins to give earthly signs. And when we think about these signs, we need to be aware of what's going on around the world. And as we think about these signs, we can put them in sort of three categories, okay? So here's the first one. Before Jesus returns, there's going to be suffering throughout the earth. This is the first category, all right? And so the Bible gives us some clues and signs here. The first one is that they're going to be what's called false messiahs. Jesus says, watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many. Now, if you go on Google and search, you know, false prophets or false uh, people who have claimed to be Jesus, there's a long list of people, and I didn't want to put that list on here. But there's a lot of people that have come and said, I am the Christ, and they're not. So Jesus is saying, well, as we get closer to the time when he returns, there's going to be a lot of false uh, prophets and false messiahs. So be aware of that. That is one sign pointing to the end times. Another sign that you're seeing around the world right now is wars, famines, pestilence, earthquakes. Verse 6, Jesus says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilence, earthquakes in various places. And so, as we think about this, you know, Jesus says, it's going to happen, don't be alarmed, the, famine, uh, the, the end is still to come. But we can see already in history, if you are like a historian or taking any history courses or you're into these kinds of things, you will know that we've had these signs already happening. For example, I was reading an article, what were the top five wars in our history. World War II, according to this article, is the deadliest war in our history with over 70 million deaths. And then number two is the Mongol conquest, which was in 13th century, and it was 60 to 70 million people that died during that time. Then World War I, which was between 1914 and 1918, we had again 17 million deaths. And then number four, we have the 17th century uh, Manchu conquest of China, 25 million, million lives claimed. And the last one there, you can see the French Revolution of 1789, 6.5 million people died. A lot of people have died because of, because of wars. We can see that here. But these are not just the only wars. There's been plenty of other wars. Again, if you Google wars on your computer, you'll see many uh, incidents of wars. What about earthquakes? This is from uh, Wikipedia here. And um, you can see here the top three have been in China, unfortunately. And then there's a column here with the money of people who have died and then the magnitude of the earthquakes. And then the fourth one was in Turkey in 526. And then in Indonesia, December 26, 2004, we had that serious earthquake that happened. And if you're following the news, you know you've seen earthquakes happening worldwide. Amen? Right? And so um, these are signs again. What about famines? Again, these are another article I read. What were the most economical or deadly famines that have taken a place worldwide? And there's many, okay? And here's, again, a whole bunch of different ones. Uh, the Great Bengal in India. Um, 10 million people died in that one. Soviet famine, 1932-1933. Um, 3 to 8 million. Then you've got uh, number three here, I think, is in South Asia. And then four in uh, China. And then number five is in the Persian famine, which took place, I believe, in Iran. And 8 to 10 million people have died. So we can say the Bible has spoke about these signs, and we can say that these things are happening, right? We can't, we can't be oblivious to the fact that these things are happening. 
And Jesus said, these are signs that I am coming again and coming soon. All right, and then pestilence, diseases. We know worldwide right now there are things going on that people are talking about and we know. And it's not just what's happening right now, but we've had other uh, disease and plagues happen to other countries around the world. And so these are, let us see, birth pains. Jesus says, all these are the beginning of birth pains. And this image that Jesus is using is, so, is, is, is to basically say that um, Jesus is saying that I'm with you right now, but there's going to be time when it will all come together and I'm coming back. And he's saying we are experiencing birth pains until Jesus returns. And so I'm, I'm just going to read what this commentary says, because if you're a woman and you've had a baby, you will understand this analogy. The metaphor in birth pains is used to highlight a different facet of the prenatal process that on the onset of a childbirth, it's not steady, but repeated phenomenon coming in waves over and over again. So a woman, when she begins to go into labor, she then uh, has waves of pains. And so this is what Jesus is saying here. And so the baby does not come on the first pain. Um, it, it, it just tells you that it's now starting. And then, he's, and then in the commentaries, we don't know if the baby's going to come on the fifth the 15th or 50th or 500th pain, but we know that the baby's coming because we're getting the pain. And the same thing, we're gonna have periods of wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, famines, wash over the history of the world, each reminding us that the end is coming. And no one knows when the Son of Man will appear but throughout the labor, throughout the labor process, as with a, with a woman, she's on her guard. We need to be on our guard too. We can't just be like, "Oh, that's another earthquake, another flood." No, these are signs that Jesus is coming. All right. And some people will say that uh, when the pain comes, you know, we've had this in this in our past too. Like in 2000, so many people were predicting that the time, the end times were coming. Then 2020, everyone's like, oh, the end times are coming. Don't be deceived. Nobody knows the hour or the time. All right? But what we have to know is that we see the signs that Jesus is coming. And the beginning of this birth pain of Jesus coming was actually Jerusalem falling in 70 AD. And so since then, we've had these signs, right? And so here's the second round or the second category of signs. Number two, before Jesus returns, there will be suffering of Jesus' disciples. All right? So then he begins to talk about persecution. Verse 9. He says, Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and to be put to death. But you will be hated by all nations because of me. So Jesus warns the disciples that as you spread the gospel truth, you are going to be persecuted. And the disciples will be handed over. And so worldwide right now, where are the top 10 places around the world right now where it's deadly to be a Christian? This is another article I was reading. Unfortunately, number one is North Korea. Number two is Afghanistan, where Christianity is not permitted to exist. Number three is Somalia. Number four is Libya. Number five is Pakistan. Number six is Sudan. Number seven is Eritrea. And number eight is Yemen, number nine, it's Iran, number 10, it's India. These are the places around the world where Christianity is um, facing a lot of discrimination and Christians are facing persecution. A lot of them are having to leave their hometown, their countries, because they're dying. They are being killed. They're being murdered. And we call these folks that are dying for their faith martyrs. And so Jesus warns us that when you are a Christian, unfortunately, and you believe in God and you put your faith in Christ, you will be persecuted. Now here in North America, it doesn't seem like that bad um, because it isn't as bad. It is worse, of course, in these other countries. You're not even allowed to say the name Jesus. Um, but this is a real reality for a lot of people. And this is another sign. Another sign of Jesus' return is betrayal. He says, at the time, many will turn from their faith and will betray and hate each other. So some people, they will believe in God, but because of all this turmoil and all this, um, you know, suffering they're going through, they're going to walk away from their faith. 
And because of that, they don't want to. They don't want to deal with suffering. They want to be comfortable. Um, they don't want to deal with the discrimination. So they will walk away from their faith. And uh, this is an indication that you know maybe they didn't really believe in the first place. Another example of uh, challenges is deception. Again, false prophets will appear, and many people will believe that Jesus has arrived and and he hasn't, and they're going to teach the wrong things. And then the Bible says wickedness and lovelessness. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. And this is really sad. Due to those who betray their faith in Jesus and false prophets, it's going to cause the hearts of people to become cold. Like they don't want to love anymore or feel anymore. And uh, love is not an emotion. It's a commitment to God and to promote God's will. So in our walk with God, we don't just walk with him because we feel like it. It's just like parents. You don't just love your child one day and hate them the next. I hope you don't. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, they might do something to upset you, but hopefully you still have that love for, the, for your child. And uh, the same thing with God. God expects us to love unconditionally, not love by our feelings. That it is, we make a choice to love. If you're married, you choose to love your spouse. You're a parent, you choose to love your kids. You choose to love people when you're a Christian. You can't be like, oh, I just hate that person. I don't like this person. Sure, there's different personality types and so forth, but we have to love. Amen? And then, number three in your notes today, another sign, before Jesus returns, um, the gospel will be preached to all nations, okay? This is number four, uh, verse 14. The gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. All right. So here's some interesting facts. I read a great article, 2019 Facts and Trends About Christianity. This is some encouraging facts that we can learn here today. Um, here's the first one. Christianity is growing faster than the population. Globally, Christianity is growing at, at a rate of 1.27. There are currently 2.5 billion Christians in the world. The world's population right now is 7.7 .7 billion, and that is growing at a rate of 1.2. So this is great. We are growing at a faster rate than the population growth. Now here's another interesting fact about Christianity. The center of Christianity has moved to the global south. So in 1900, there were twice as many Christians who lived in Europe than the world. Today, Latin America and Africa have more Christians. By 2050, the number of Christians in Asia will also pass the number in Europe. Currently, Christianity is barely growing in Europe, 0.04, and North America is only like 0.56. So when I go to a lot of meetings, we see that um, Nazarenes, for example, in North America and in Europe, it's plateauing. Like, there's no high rise in the growth, and there's not a dip. It's just sort of constant. But when we get the reports about Asia and Middle East and Africa, the numbers are going off the chart. So there's been a shift in where Christianity is growing. And so it says there that Oceania and Latin America have marginally better and Asia 1.89 and Africa 2.89 is growing at that rate. So Christianity is, is, is not declining, it's just shifting where it's growing. And so this also uh, reminds us that there are more evangelistic opportunities now than there was back in the day. The vast majority of non-Christian li live their lives and never interact with a Christian, but that number is shrinking. In 1900, only 5.5 of non-Christians knew a Christian. Today, that number is 18.3%. So that's good news. So obviously the number is still small, but the growing percentage grants more non-believers the opportunity to hear the gospel truth. And then going back, remember what I said here, um, so the world has to hear, the, the entire nation has to be evangelized before Jesus returns. And so here's an interesting fact here as well, and this is the last of the study of the article. The percentage of unevangel unevangelized is actually shrinking. More than half of the world's population in 1900, 54%, were unevangelized. That percentage continues to shrink now to 28% in 2019. That means we're doing a good job. You know, we, we pray about sending missionaries, we, we pray about sending people to, to evangelize, and they're doing it. But that still means that 2.2 billion people living today are still considered 
unevangelized. And how many of you did the math? 1900 to 2019 is 119 years. It was 50% and then dropped down to 28. So think about it. It's possible in the next 100 years, the entire world could be evangelized. And that would mark us even closer to the coming of Jesus. It may even be in 50 years because we are now a global community that communicates faster than we ever did before, right? I hope I'm not boring you. Is this interesting? So we know denominations are present in every place around the world. It's not just Nazarenes. We've got Pentecostals, Methodists, Alliance Church, Salvation Army, all sorts of denominations going around preaching the gospel. We do it together. We will get our mission done, which is to see everyone to know Jesus. Amen? So Jesus says the following. So when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation, spoken through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. And this is an important statement that Jesus is making. He is saying to the disciples that when you see in the holy place, which he talks about is the temple, the places of God that are holy, an abomination, then we are getting closer to the end time. And even the prophet Daniel in the Old Testament prophesied about this. He said that, uh, so during the time of Daniel in 168 BC, BC meaning before Christ, Antioch Epiphany sacrificed a pig to Zeus on the sacred temple altar. Daniel 9, 27, 11, 30, 31 is, tells about this. And this was an abom a nation, okay? Then in 70 AD, so this is the time after Christ, uh, the temple of Jerusalem fell and it was destroyed. Titus placed an idol on the site of the burnt, uh, the burnt temple. This was an abomination, right? So abomination meaning an offensive form of idolatry. And then at the end times, 2 Thessalonians 2.4, Revelation 13 says, in the end times, the Antichrist will set up an image of himself so everyone will worship him. Jesus is saying, this is an abomination in a holy place. And when you see these things happening, Jesus says, and it has happened already in the book of Daniel and then in, the, uh, in uh, 70 AD and to come, Jesus is saying, let the reader understand, meaning let the reader know and be aware that the time is coming. And so this is number four today in your notes. We need to take the signs pointing to Jesus' return seriously. Amen. Amen? And so he, then he begins to go into this whole thing with, uh, with the disciples. He's like, when this all happens, he's like, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof go back to their house or take anything. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be for those people who are pregnant and nursing their babies. And to pray that your flight will not take place in winter or in the Sabbath. So Jesus began to say, like, real life is going to happen. And when the abomination of desolation begins, and we are getting now to the return of Jesus, all these things are going to be happening. And, and don't do these things, he's saying. Um, or, or t for example, the first 16 says, flee to Judea. And they... Um, basically, historians believe verse 16 has already happened during the revolt of um, Christians. But going to 17, like, don't go back to the roof and don't go back to your field and get your cloak. Uh, basically, Jesus is saying the time has come and you have to be ready. And verse 19 says, you know, how dreadful it will be for pregnant women. And what he's talking about here is vulnerable people. Vulnerable people uh, like women who are going to be pregnant and have their infants are going to suffer the most when Jesus returns. And then verse 20, pray that your flight will not take place. What he's saying, pray that your travel, if you're traveling, um, it says here, flight in winter when roads are washed out and rivers are swollen presents even more difficulty for those fleeing the horrors of the approaching ruin. And in prayer, the disciples must cling to God's presence every day, even though they may, may, may have to be disrupted, even though those most religious people like you and I who are here on Sunday honoring God. And he's talking about the Sabbath, which for the Jewish people was Saturday. And so we don't know the time, we don't know the hour, but we have to be ready. And unfortunately, th folks are going to be doing regular life, and this is going to happen. And those folks are going to have to suffer the most. And so verse 21 says the following, 
for then there will be great distress unequaled from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again. This is a pretty serious statement because what Jesus is saying here is when the earth launches into abomination of the great desolation that Jesus was talking about, the, this period, this begins the period of the great distress of the earth, which is unequal to the beginning of time to now. And so here's what the commentary says. Jesus said that this will be the most awful time in all history. When we think of the terrible wars and plagues, famines and genocides history has seen, this is a sobering statement. When God pours out his wrath on a God-rejecting world, it will be a truly great tribulation. All right? And so they know that's like serious and it is serious, um, but we have to also know, and I will conclude on a positive note here, um, going back to here, Oh, I don't have this in your notes. But if you look at verse 22, if those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. What, G what they're saying there is, even though all of this is going to be happening, God is still in control. Amen. Okay? And when they say, for the sake of the elect, that's talking about people who believe in the Lord. Okay? So there's still going to be control. There's still going to be protection. But all of these things have to happen because now it's the end time. Okay? And so that's why we have to take our time with God very seriously. And this is number five today. We have to be ready for Jesus' return. We have to take our relationship with God seriously. This sermon was not meant to scare you. This sermon was not to make you feel fearful. Uh, you are not obligated to do anything. God gives you free will. But this sermon was meant to bring clarity to what's going on in the world and why it's going on. And we need to know that as each day passes, we are getting closer to the end times. We need to acknowledge that Jesus is real. We have to acknowledge that there is a God. And we can't go around acting like God does not exist because he does. He created the world. He created the heavens and the earth. He created you and me. He breathed life in us. And so we can choose. We can choose to reject God or we can choose to embrace the Lord. And we have to know there's a serious consequence to that. This is real. This is not fake. Jesus himself said, all the things that are happening right now are going to be signs that I am coming again. And so we, when we go and tell people these things, we're not looking to scare people. We're actually just trying to say this is the truth of God. And that we have to be ready. And so you can choose to be ready now or choose to be ready later, but don't be late. Amen? Choose now to follow God and be ready and get ready to, to accept God's invitation to heaven. Otherwise, we'll get, we'll, we will be caught up in an internal separation from God. And that is a real reality. Some people believe that when you die, everything goes black. But the truth of the matter is that your soul will now, based on your choices here, your soul will rest in eternity, either in separation from God or with the Lord. And so the Bible is very clear on this, and we need to take it seriously. And you can't bank on, like I said last week, that you're going to live to 50, 60, 70, 80, because look at uh, all these different people that are dying. Case in point, last week, unfortunately, nine people died in that helicopter uh, as people were going to a basketball uh, basketball game and we have to be ready at all times we just don't know when our last day is going to be so have you accepted the invitation of letting jesus be lord in your life that's the serious question we need to make today the bible says for god to love the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life so jesus's goal is not to scare you it's not to make you upset or frustrated the bible says in john 10 um, 11, 10, 10 says, um, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's the devil. But Jesus came to give you abundant life. And abundance doesn't mean material things and possession. It means salvation. It means adoption, forgiveness, grace. It's spiritual blessings. Amen? And so as we prepare for communion, I want us to really think about these signs. You've now been more educated on the scripture here. And maybe you may need to be able to explain this better to other people. But let's now prepare for communion. And as we think about communion, take the time for communion, it, it, we're reminded again of the death and resurrection of Jesus. The price God paid for our sin so that we don't go to eternal separation 
of, from God, but have eternity with our Lord. Amen? And so uh, I'm going to ask our communion servers to step forward and our uh, worship team as we get ready. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's get ready to prepare for communion together now as we continue to think about this topic and, and our, our readiness for the Lord.